Guys, welcome to the I Love Seville show. It's Jerry Miller. It's good to be with you on a Monday. I hope the weekend absolutely treated you well. We had a touch of spring in the air. My family got outside. I hope you did as well. Um, I think it was truly a gift from God what transpired over Saturday and Sunday. I enjoyed spending some time in Nelson County in the Blue Ridge Mountains with my son and my family. Um, and just really taking in some fresh air. Now I'm back in the saddle on a Monday, and I think we have a fabulous, fabulous show lined up for you. If you tuned into the program last week, you saw the man, the myth, the legend, <laughs> Dr. Bernard Harrison on set, who spotlighted the 100 black men of Central Virginia, and he did so with two young men that absolutely blew me away, Marquan Jones and Joshua St. Hill. As a result of the success of that program, we have welcomed Dr. Harrison one more time to the I Love Seville show. And he has brought two folks with him that I am so excited to introduce you to. Um, Ricky White, who is the Union Run Baptist Church pastor. That's right. And the lifetime treasure <laughs> at 100 Black Men of Central Virginia. Oh, no, no. We will get to that in a matter of moments, Ricky. We also have Sharon Milner on set. She is um, the mom of a fabulous young man in the 100 Black Men of Central Virginia. We will talk from a firsthand perspective, a parent's perspective of how this organization is changing the lives of, of the youth across Central Virginia. Before we welcome the guests to the set, ladies and gentlemen, let's thank the fine folks that make this program possible. First, Interstate Pest and Service Companies, four generation strong business, the type of businesses we love to celebrate, born and raised here, born and bred here in Central Virginia, Interstate Pest and Service Companies. The first generation started with one man, one truck, and calling people from a phone booth, literally connecting with his customers from a phone booth once the job is done. Now there's offices in the Shenandoah Valley, in Richmond, in Charlottesville. Interstate Pest and Service Companies covers the Commonwealth in totality, a success story, undoubtedly a success story, the kind we celebrate here at I Love Seville. We also want to give some big time props to the good doctor, Scott Wagner of Scott Wagner Chiropractic and Sports Medicine. This gentleman is changing people's lives one patient at a time at his practice. Who's got your back? Scott Wagner's got your back. Right. Harris Tolber, our director, Judah Wickhauer and Lauren Linsky make this program possible. I have the easy job. All I have to do is be myself on a microphone one hour a day, five days a week, and I love it. Um, on that note, Harris, let's go to the studio cam and let's welcome our friends to the set. Uh, we are all now on camera. All right. uh, the energy is palpable and ta tangible in the air. I'm gonna allow Dr. Harrison to take the show away because this gentleman helped orchestrate this entire interview. Dr. Harrison, the show is yours, my friend. Uh, I need to start with, I'm, I'm nervous. <laughs> You're not I, nervous. I'm ner <laughs> listen, listen, you, you, you told me about, look at my hand, 250,000 listeners. 53,000. Oh, come on, Jerry. Come on. <laughs> no, he's we're, never we're, nervous. We're, he's we're, not. We're, 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 gonna, we're gonna have to work with this today. <laughs> so, so what do you wanna know? I would like to know, and you introduce us about Ricky White and Sharon Milner. Oh my goodness. So let's start with the pastor, Ricky White. Yes, sir. We're talking about someone who operates from the heart, yes. a passionate person, and from the head, one of the most intelligent people that you want to ever meet. Uh, and so this, he, he began working with uh, this organization from the beginning, from the inception. And I, I recall uh, when um, moving to um, Principal Burley Middle School, I heard about this fantastic elementary teacher who's like doing all these wonderful things. All the, the students and parents mm -hmm. just loved him. And I just had to meet this guy. Mm -hmm. And so when we started this organization, 100 Black Men of Central Virginia, and we wanted to organize this uh, summer academy to focus on math, I learned that this guy was this fantastic math teacher. Mm -hmm. Fantastic math teacher. Mm -hmm. So. Hello, I need you. <laughs> He's, I don't know, I'm doing this and that, the other, a million different things. Okay, well, let's start doing something else first. We've been talking about closing achievement gaps, and a part of the achievement gap that we have is that, you know, we, we need to avoid the, chap, the gap before creating the achievement gap. So I started working with ministers. He helped me organize ministers um, in, in this area, and we educated them on what is an achievement gap. And as a result of educating them on achievement gaps, we started creating strategies with churches as to avoiding the achievement gap. Mm -hmm. And so then I was able to sell him 
on coming on being a member of the organization mm -hmm. and being this math teacher in our Summa Academy, and the rest is history. He's treasure for life. A <laughs> <laughs> math teacher would make a perfect treasure, yes. right? Treasure for life. Oh, no. <laughs> That's a lot of work. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Ricky. Um, I, before we get to your birth story, and I'm so excited to okay. feature it, I would love Dr. Harrison to spotlight Sharon Milner, here I'd say. Here we go. Are you ready for this show? I'm ready. So, so, so once again, okay, this, this is the story here. You know, oftentimes parents don't know how to advocate for their children. Sharon is a master advocate for her children, okay? And so I apologize, Sharon, for not utilizing you better over the last several years. We actually uh, use you at least once to provide some sort of training for parents. Right. But you are so good at advocating for your children. She uh -huh. has two young folks. They both are at UVA. They have been very, very successful students. It's because of that woman's passion and strength behind the scenes. So you'll hear about it, uh -huh. okay, in the Thank show. You. But just know that you have a real strong advocate, and she can tell us how to advocate for our young people. How, do, how does a 30-year-old lady have two at UVA? <laughs> Explain that to me. I'm having a hard time understanding that, Sharon. Please put that in perspective, please. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You have a, a lot. Uh, we'll, we'll start with Pastor White, and you're already getting some people giving you props. Um, Cheryl Williamson says, hi, Pastor White. God is good. Amen. Um, <laughs> David Van Buren says, hi, Pastor White. God bless you. Bless you, Dave. Okay, right. so you get some people jumping in right now, guys, and like and share the feed. We call it the birth story here. Okay. And the birth story is the evolution of the individual in Charlottesville and how he or she got to this point. So I'm going to give you an open-ended question. Put yourself personally in perspective. I know you don't like to talk about yourself, but I want to learn okay. about you. Okay. Give us the birth story start to finish and how you got to this point, sir. Okay, I was born in 1958 on a sharecropper's farm in Chesapeake, Virginia. I mean, went to um, South Southeastern Elementary School on the Great Bridge, um, Junior High School and, and Great Bridge High School. I had one teacher, Mr. Lane. Yay, Mr. Lane. Mr. Lane was a, he was a white teacher in uh, Great Bridge Junior High School who actually saw me goofing around, not doing well in math class. And guess what this man did? This man actually shook me in the hallway and said, Ricky White, you can do better. He said, tomorrow I expect you to make an A on your algebra test. And guess what? That was the first time I really went home and studied. I went home and I studied. I got an A on the math test, and from that point on, I started making straight A's in school. That's what brought me to UVA. That's why I got, came to UVA. I wanted to become an architect, uh, switched over to become a teacher, met my sweetheart, Natalie Jackson White. Well, she's white now. <laughs> Natalie Jackson White. Uh -huh. We got married, have three beautiful children, two son-in-laws, three uh, grandchildren, and it's been a wonderful ride. I have been a teacher for 18 years, I served as a minister. I've been in ministry for 40 years. I've been a pastor for 36 years. And at Union Run Baptist Church, I've actually served as pastor for 30 years, celebrating 30 years this year. That's wow. awesome. So you're a renaissance man. Yes, yes. sir. Is that safe to say, renaissance yes. man? Renaissance man. <laughs> or are you saying I'm an old man? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You're keeping so, me on my toes over here. Uh, give me the love story, how you met your wife. Man, my, my wife's a beautiful lady. Uh -huh. I play as Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity okay. on the campus of UVA. Okay. We always went around and tried to find the ones. Oh, cute girl on <laughs> campus. The times have not changed. Yeah. 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 She became a sweetheart, you know. And then she became my sweetheart, and then I asked her to marry. I think it was about two weeks after I was dating her, and man, I said, I gotta marry this woman. I said, Natalie, can you marry me? And she looked up at me, and she didn't say anything at first. But then guess what? She said yes. <laughs> Woo! When that happened, man, that was awesome. <laughs> Nancy Porter says, "Go, Reverend White, go, baby." <laughs> you. <laughs> Let's get Sharon in the mix here. Sharon, give us the same. The birth story, the evolution, start to finish. I found out off air, and I don't want to steal your thunder because this is something huge. We're celebrating, undoubtedly, a double Wahoo. Yes. Multiple degrees <laughs> from the University of Virginia. That is so baller. Give us the, uh, give us the birth story, Sharon. Okay, well, I am originally from Massachusetts. I am a New England Patriots fan. Um, I uh, ended up in Charlottesville. I went to UVA. And I got my undergraduate degree here, and as well as my master's degree. And I work in Charlottesville. And um, I've been in Charlottesville long enough that I presently have two children at UVA right now. One is an Eccles Scholar. Wow. Um, the other one is um, in the McIntyre School of Business. 
Um, and that is my son who was a part of the 100 Black Men of Central Virginia. He started when he was in fifth grade. Um, and it's just been such a wonderful program. Uh, I, as far as parents, parenting goes, it, you know, you tell your kids things and you talk to them about things, but there's sometimes it's really nice to have support of another person or other people kind of reinforcing what you're seeing at home. And that is where the 100 really stepped in and helped our family a lot as far as getting Kai to where he is right now. Um, he's 19 years old, he's a third year at UVA, and he is just really um, doing well. And even while he's in school, Pastor Rick, Ricky White, who was his uh, mentor, Woo. still, still stays in contact like with that. him, still <laughs> helps him with things and talks to him about things. And I mean, th that, you, that kind of support you cannot buy. It's invaluable. I love it. I love it. Turn both their answers into sizzle reels. Those are highlights from the interviews that we get, more sh shorter, approachable clips. I want to, you know, my son is one. So I got a long ways to go here, but I, <laughs> since I've had a, my son and had my son, since my wife's had her son, I've been there to support her. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have had a, a, a different perspective on life. Mm -hmm. um, it has broadened my horizons, um, and it sounds cliche, but so many different ways. Sure. So it's helped shaping my mindset now in ways that I never considered prior to his birth. Where I'm going with this is, as, as, as a mom who is a double who, to have both your sons at arguably the number one university in the country. Can you put in perspective the sense of pride oh, that yes. you have for, for your young men? Yes, well, I have a son and a daughter. So okay. my daughter is the oldest. Okay. Um, and then I have a son. Um, you know, they've worked hard. So it's not just a matter of them just getting into a school. They really put in a lot of effort. Um, they took a lot of classes, did a lot of activities, and so, what I'm proud of the most is the fact that they persevered, that they worked hard. There were a lot of nights I know that they were tired after sports practice and different things, but they still did their homework. Um, and I think that that, you know, having support um, of the family, I mean, my, um, and their dad, and then having the support of Ricky White and Dr. Hairston and all the other men um, really helped my son push him further. He liked math, but, you know, he wasn't, as huge a math as he was until after the 100. And then he really loved math, so much so that now his major is business and finance. So, I mean, I just really think that that has That's been awesome. really, really helpful and really supportive. Dr. Harrison, your thoughts here? I mean, uh, the 100 black men in Central Virginia helping um, not only as positive role models, but introducing curriculums and, and maybe changing the perspective of the curriculum from something that is not approachable to being approachable. I think we all understand the importance of math in anyone's life, mm -hmm. um, anyone's career path. What's this make you feel like? Well, it makes me feel good because, you know, anybody can have an ideal, but how do you turn that ideal into a dream? Okay? It all starts with how do you make things better? And so we know that math is one of those, or algebra is one of those gateway subjects that if you can do well in algebra, you can do well in most other subject areas. So the dream in creating this MQ Academy that Sharon has talked about uh, it started with, you know, if we can prepare more students to be successful in algebra, they're going to be more successful in life. The whole mission of the 100 Black Men of Central Virginia is about uh, preparing our young men uh, to, uh, to be greater contributors to society and to improve the quality of life for this whole area through their work. So you have a Kai Milner who's going to graduate from UVA and he's going to make about $150,000. You think that's going to... Lord willing. So we have so many intelligent black young men. <laughs> <laughs> he gets 10%, Kai. <laughs> Remember, he's, 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 he's in the darkness school of business, so he's going to take care of himself care, first yes. and foremost. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this work that we're doing, it's about, um, you know, providing opportunities for so many of our young men because they are brilliant and you have a choice. They can be brilliant and, and, and uh, you know, figure out how to take all your money from you or they can be brilliant and work for you to help you make money. So, you know, we're preparing our young men to be brilliant and to use those skills. So when you talk about, you know, how do you do this in terms of curriculum, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to just kind of tee up Pastor White. Okay. So, so, and a lot of it has to do when you are being successful with students and, and turning them on to math, for example, okay. relating to them. So Pastor White created this newsletter. This, this is dated 2011. And there's a photo right here 
of Ka Milda, the second young man, he was the editor. Not only did Pastor White you know, get him turned on to math, but he loved to write. And wow. he also made him the editor of this first newsletter. Right. Now, there's a whole lot of cultural relevance in this newsletter, like problems associated with funny face people. Yeah. You may want to, you may want to give that to Should him. Should I give it to Pastor? Uh, 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 Here we go. Tell him to explain that. It's going to bring back some memories in terms of, you know, being a really, really high level educator who understands high expectations, understands how you make math fun. Exactly. Okay? And turn kids on to believing that they can be really, really good students, good leaders, and good people. I, I'm going to get out of the way. So <laughs> I think one of the main things is making sure that people understand that life is a simile or uh -huh. a metaphor. Uh -huh. Let the kids know that math is also a simile or a metaphor. Okay. I, tell, I, I tell the young kids, too, parents, teach your kids to speak in similes and metaphors because when they speak in similes and metaphors, they can see things through an abstract way. Sure. And it makes a teacher pause when they speak to them. So one thing I wanted to do was to uh, create uh, something within the math program, the MQ program, where uh, the students actually became characters within uh, the math problems. Sure. So I could take a very difficult math problem, then I could uh, actually take um, the student, put them as a character in that problem, put Dr. Harrison in, in the problem. I think one of the pictures I actually took Dr. Harrison, put dreadlocks on him. <laughs> uh, one of the other pros I, I made um, him, he became like Bowtie Jones there. You know, so it was a lot of different things. And then the kids were actually uh, uh, solve these problems. So down in the bottom, I actually took uh, the brothers and students and made characters out of them and then began to uh, put them in, into the You made it approachable. I made it, I made you it made approachable. You made it human. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right, human. And then I also made some characters. There's another character made called M Square versus M Cube. Okay. Mm -hmm. And M Square versus M Cube. M Square was always somebody that was goofing all, messing up, you know, and but then M Cube was somebody who was always trying to get things right, to operate in a greater than and not drop down into less than. And so that's one thing that we told the kids, that no matter what you're doing, you know, always strive to operate in the better, the best, uh, the bet on the good, the better, best, and not drop down into the bad, worse, and worse. I love it. And so, and I love it. It's, and it's successful. The best teachers, from my perspective, and I'm going to throw this to you, Sharon, the best teachers, from my perspective, took the curriculum and the content, and they tied it somehow to real life, yes. so I could uh, wrap my brain around it, and I can embrace that content, and I would want to learn it, as opposed to keep it in, in uh, you know, terms that were just textbook terms, exactly. where when it was textbook terms, it seemed like work. When it was content that was tied to real life and what I was experiencing from a day-to-day -day basis, I wanted to embrace it because it was a challenge that I was up for. Mm -hmm. um, put that in perspective for me and how you've seen it with your kids. Well, I just feel like the 100 was just engaging. The M the MQ um, summer program and the math, I would go in the beginning, you know, where they have the meet and greet and everything, and I would see so many kids that were more shy, they didn't really talk that much, but really, um, Dr. Harrison, Pastor White, and all the other gentlemen really held their feet to the fire and made them speak up, look at people um, in the eyes, um, talk loudly so people can hear you, yes ma'am, no sir, that kind of social graces that some kids in this day, unfortunately, don't really have someone telling them what to do. Um, I remember one time I had done a program for the um, where I was talking about code switching and how you talk to your friends is different than how you would talk to your parents or how you would talk to teachers at school. And so um, that was something that I thought was really important and helpful. And I just really saw so many kids because I've, they started with fifth grade and went to their senior year just blossom and to such intelligent, um, thoughtful, well-spoken men. And I mean, I just thought that that was amazing. I was literally, I'm gonna throw this back to you because you've got me thinking here. I was literally having the conversation with a friend of mine on Friday about the value of having a skill set like code switching, where you're able to adapt perhaps your, your, your dialect, your vernacular, your body language, how you go about communicating, depending on what setting or, or who you're speaking with. Exactly. And it breeds a level of um, authentic trust and human connection mm -hmm. that otherwise is not present prevalent when you're just, you know, stiff, lacking confidence, feet down, right. hands in your pocket. Um, put that in perspective of the value that you're seeing with your kids or 
the youth in general, and then maybe, maybe as a second part of the question, what are some of the challenges you're seeing, because you're still very close to it, some of the challenges you're seeing with teens um, in, in embracing school and embracing academic success in today's environment. A lot of it's got to be tied to this darn thing, exactly, right? Exactly, yes, exactly. Yes. Well, one thing I will say is, and this is something my mom's always said, good manners will get you far in life. Mm -hmm. Good manners will get you far. And people will be willing, they, people judge you by how you speak, what you're wearing, um, how you talk. Whether it's good or bad, people will do it. That's just the nature of people. And so one of the things that I know that the 100 instilled is, you know, making sure your pants are appropriate, making sure you look nice. They would have them dress up, which some of the boys, when the fifth and sixth grade, mm -hmm. it was the first time that they had to wear nice clothes mm -hmm. or a tie. Or, you know, um, they had like the tie, um, how to learn how to tie uh, necktie sessions and things like that. If those are skills, if your family doesn't have them or don't teach you, you don't know. And you're behind as far as other people, your contemporaries who are trying to get jobs or trying to do other things. So that's one thing I really felt that the 100 was really good at is helping kids realize these things when they may or may not have family or other members to teach that to them. I love that answer. And I'll throw this to Dr. Harrison. In the ubiquitous age of iPhones and smartphones and social media, oftentimes perception is reality or oftentimes we are judging books by their cover, whether right or wrong, it is happening. And it sounds like the organization is not only working on the approachability aspect of academia, but you guys are evolving boys into being gentlemen. Absolutely. Put that in perspective for me, because I love it. Okay. So you have a gentleman right here. What they see is what they'll be. Uh, I'm, and I'm going to make a connection with that answer to the two young men that were here last week. Mentor. Okay. Outstanding person. He mentored Kai Milner. Okay. From fifth grade through high school and in college. Kai Milner was a leader in his school. Correct me. Was he ninth grade president or a, a vice president? A vice ninth, president, yeah. Tenth grade president. president or vice president? Vice president. And this okay. guy okay. knows it better yeah, than I you. Remember, <laughs> oh my God, I'm terrible. Worst mom ever. No. Le eleventh grade president. I thought he was president one year. No. Okay. And then twelfth grade, he was vice president of the student council association. Right. right. He started out as a strong leader in that school. And last week we talked about Marquan. We talked about this young man by the name of Josh Beeler, mm -hmm. who was ninth grade president, 10th grade president, yes. 11th grade tw president, 12th grade president. Kai opened the door for, for, for that young man. Love it. Pastor White opened the door for Kai. Right. Guess who Josh Beeler's mentor was? Who's that? You're looking at it. I love it. Uh -huh. okay? I love it. Okay. And so you had Kai, Josh Beeler, Marquard Jones, and they're opening doors for other young men. I love okay. It. Mm -hmm. Who are, you know, who are offsetting those stereotypes that you have of, of African-American males. And that's the whole, that's one of the primary intents tent of this organization. Look at this man right here. I love you, it. You could be him. You guys are, it's a generational impact. Yeah. It's undoubtedly a genera generational impact that's having this like, almost like exponential viral snowball effect. Mm -hmm. If you could put that in perspective of how, I mean, you, you epitomize class. Mm -hmm. I mean, education, human connection, energy, positivity, mm -hmm. and you are radiated. You, when you walked in, I felt it. Same with you. Uh -huh. You know, I, I literally felt it are when you, you walked in. Or, or? I, I, <laughs> I am talking about you, sir. I mean, when you walked in, I felt it. Um, and passing that on, I mean, it's not, it's not an easy task to pass that yeah. on. I remember being, you know, I was, I was a leader. A lot of times I was leading in the wrong ways. You know, I was leading kids to do things that got us into trouble, mm -hmm. as opposed to leading us to do things the right way. Mm -hmm. um, Put all this in perspective, the challenges that you face perhaps with taking someone from fifth grade through senior. Sometimes we were angry. We didn't even know why we were angry. Right, one, thing, one thing that I always wanted to share is that we have to learn how to shift. Okay, you need to recognize where you are. Okay, and that's why I like using, I use it a lot, you know, the, uh, the norm and operating in the greater than and recognizing the less than. You got to recognize when you have a bad attitude. Right. You need to recognize, you know, when things are going wrong, that you need to shift from, from this particular place and get into that place, you know, that, that you are happier and a place where you're not about getting in trouble. And at the same time, you need to learn how to shift when a teacher is in the negative zone. Right. Because if the teacher is in a negative zone, you know that if you don't shift from where you are into a more positive zone, you're going to be in trouble. Right? You know, so it's and about shifting. And that's a microcosm shifting. for professional yes. life. Yes, right. you got to know how to shift in every situation. 
you know, so I think that's, that's really important. That's one thing I always try to, to teach, you know, my kids, my family, you know, at church, all of us need to learn how to shift to get in that place where we're walking in, in the good, the better, the blessing, the good, the better, the anointed, the good, the better, you know, the best, you know, and, and not operate in that place, you know, where we're going to be in trouble, where we're going to be uh, chastised or whatever. What are some of the most challenging aspects of that uh, human evolution? What age or what elements uh, or dynamics that you've seen? Well, I believe, now I was a fifth grade teacher. Okay. For, I, I love fifth grade because They're you can polish, yes. Yeah. You, you can really do a lot of polishing. Uh -huh. But then as some of those chemicals in their bodies begin to kick <laughs> in and in sixth, seventh, eighth grade, you know, things you know, change. Sure. But we have to back all the way up to like first, second, third grade to make sure that those kids are able to get, uh, to reach their potential. And what I found out is that a lot of kids at the, at the early ages, they aren't reaching their potentials because people aren't expecting them to have a greater potential. So we need to make sure that the younger kids have a greater potential, that the teachers can see that they can operate in the greater than, not just good, but operating the best. Okay, then when they get into those, those later years, they'll do better. I love yes. that answer. How about the firsthand perspective you've seen um, sharing with your son? You know, it's one thing if, if your parents say something. It's one thing if somebody like Ricky White says something. Right. Put that in perspective for me. Well, I feel like Pastor White is like a rock uh -huh. dropped in the pond, and he creates many, <laughs> many ripples. <laughs> and I feel that Simile. That... <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what you're talking about. <laughs> and I mean, I just feel that that has been something that's been... As a parent, you know, I had to do a lot of advocating for my children as far as, you know, my son, when he was in um, third grade, they called me the first day of school and they said that they wanted to put him in fourth grade. And so it was just, you know, it was kind of a challenging, not quite sure kind of thing. And then when he went to fifth grade, you know, I just really wanted to make sure that he was continuing on a good pace as far as school is concerned. And then that's when the 100 came in. And I think that they really heavily supported him because he was a lot younger than everybody else and smaller than everyone else at that time. And I really feel like just having support, he walked tall even though he was the shortest, I think. <laughs> I love that. I, and I can relate to that. I can relate to it. Jump in here, Dr. Harrison. Okay, so um, you've talked a lot about uh, my son, Brandon. Great kid. Great, and, uh, great man. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been reflecting on um, some of those comments that you've made. And, um, and reflecting back, I was in graduate school at uh, Virginia Tech. Okay. And I had one of my friends from Africa, I think he was from Ghana, approach me about writing um, a poem for a book that he wanted to publish. And I recall um, writing with a, 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 the title, um, I Have Been Brainwashed, A Message to My Son. I Have Been Brainwashed, A Message to My Son. So. The message was about, as an African-American male, growing up in Martinsville, Virginia, in the um, 60s and 70s and 80s, um, we were, I was, led to believe that I was inferior. Socially, uh, inferior academically, that was basically the norm at the time. I was, I was programmed to be less than and to believe it. So this poem to my son was, you know, whenever you're born, son, my job is to deprogram myself before you, you are in this world so that I can teach you not to be brainwashed. Wow. Wow. This organization wow. yeah. addresses the stereotypes that we buy into, the inferiority that we buy into, and the work that needs to be done to not get caught up into being brainwashed. That was amazing. Mm. Wow. Let's sizzle reel that, Harris. That was wow. the highlight of the show right there. I, I want to I I throw this to Pastor White. And Pastor White, you're getting a lot of props here. Um, Byron Clemens Sr., the anointing is on you. Praise God. Um, Dorothy Waller says the Wallers are watching. You guys are fantastic. Um, Shirley uh, Williamson has got a, a comment. We're going to get to that, Shirley. We appreciate you guys watching the show. If you guys could like and share the stream, that would mean the world to us. Mm -hmm. We're working hard for you here. Um, you know, I, I, 
love what I do because I love to connect with others and I love to learn from others. And every day, whether in this setting or with meetings over at my desk, I have the pleasure of talking with C-suite individuals, CEOs, CMOs, CFOs, you know, entrepreneurs, heads of charities, and I learn. Every day for me is like an MBA. Mm -hmm. And I take that knowledge and I apply it to another client or I apply it to something else. And it's invigorating. Um, and, and one of the things I learned was from a gentleman that I play that is part of our, our, our fellowship, and its fellowship is tied to a, a sport we play called racquetball. Mm -hmm. And this particular individual, and I'm gonna throw this to you, Pastor White said, Jerry, how's fatherhood so far? And I made the comment, I said, I said, I'm loving uh, raising my son, something along those lines. And he said, Jerry, and he's you know 70, has three or four kids, has a handful of grandchildren. He says, we um, were not given uh, children by God to raise them. We were given children by God to become better men ourselves. And when he said that to me, and I was like, God, he's wow. so right. Because this little 25 pound, you know, bundle of love is like changed my mindset from perhaps things I wasn't supposed to be doing or just being razor focused on business to like opening up my mindset on things that like I never even considered. Um, and, and I want to throw that to you. You have much more perspective to offer than I do. Um, show us yours anywhere you want to go. So <clears throat> I say we live beneath the skin. Okay, and because we live beneath the skin, that there's more precious stuff beneath the skin than people even realize. Okay, so because of that, there's a value that our children are actually given to us that we're going to learn from. And I'm excited about, about my children. I'm, I'm, my wife and I have three children. They are extremely successful. Okay, and uh, we're so happy for what, what's going on in life. They've actually married two successful men, our two daughters. We have successful grandchildren. I mean, I could brag a whole lot, but I don't. Okay, because I know that, that they've been given to me by God and that uh, I'm a care keeper. I can do whatever I can to, to help them. And they're actually blessing the world through the gifts, the talents, and the intelligence that, that they have. So uh, just realize that, that we live beneath the skin. We do a lot of stuff about what's going on, on this, with the skin, okay? But actually, we live beneath the skin. And that's what's so precious. I love that. Sharon, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I just think that having a program where you have people who are so invested in your children is so beneficial not only for families or the child themselves but also for the community at large because what they're doing is helping foster strong healthy um, confident men who can you know go into a job interview and hold their own, who can um, talk to different people. I mean, they have them talk to, I mean, it was like different coaches, um, CEOs, CFOs, different people, and they were able to hold their own just because of the mentorship that they received. And I think that that is just so amazing and extremely important. How does the organization, um, Dr. Harrison, continue to evolve? It sounds like through young men like her son getting involved, and you know, I think it was um, it was it was Marquan Jones or Josh Sainhill. I'm pretty sure it was Marquan Jones who said this um, on the previous show when he had um, when he encountered um, Dr. Bellamy, and Dr. Bellamy knew the music, and he and, and he could talk the talk, and he at the same time knew the curriculum and was able to educate, inspire, and 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 open up minds, and he felt a connection because of the closeness and age between himself and Dr. Bellamy. Seems like, and I don't want to assume, and I'm gonna throw it to you, that could be perhaps another evolution of the organization as we get her son involved into the organization to help the next level of fifth graders. Oh, mm -hmm. oh absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Kai, for example, as I said, has influenced so many other young men. Um, we haven't talked about him being the national mentee of the year for the 100 black men of America. So you're not talking about just an ordinary person here. You're talking about an exceptional young man, an exceptional family, following in the footsteps of an exceptional leader. Um, he's part of an organization um, in the first five years was recognized as the national uh, chapter of the year through the 100 black men of America. We're talking about an organization with 110 chapters and nationally over 10,000 members. And then two years later, receiving that same recognition. So in terms of evolution, success breeds 
okay? Success. And without a doubt, the young men who are going through this program will become mentors, and they will carry this message on. How do I know this? For me, it was Boy Scouts, okay? I camped out all the time. As a teacher, I connected with my, my students, taking them on camping trips, 50, 60 students on camping trips. As a baseball coach, I bonded with them, okay? Took them away for the weekend, and I had them. You on my team, we can understand who the leaders are, right. okay? And this, these are some things that we are gonna do as a team here so that we can learn how to work together. So for me, it was about Boy Scouts. For these young men who are going, going through this mentoring program, I guarantee you, okay, it's a part of them and it's gonna continue. I saw it firsthand in the last show when some of your previous athletes, the athletes that you had coached, like the Buster Foxes of the oh, world, yeah. Oh, yeah. who's watching now, yeah. Yeah. Um, and he was talking about, he was literally remembering firsthand anecdotal experiences I mean, Buster's probably what, mid-20s now? He's 29. Yeah, 29? Yes. Okay, so we're talking about from 12, 15 years ago. And he was talking about down to the T, I mean, dotting the I and crossing mm -hmm. to the T of the firsthand perspective and experiences and life lessons that you had taught him through sports. Mm -hmm. It's got to make you feel pretty good. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. I was also kind of a character on the field. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine that. Uh, no surprise. <laughs> <laughs> What were you doing on the field, Dr. Hurst? <laughs> Anything and everything? <laughs> Ask Buster. He'll tell you. <laughs> you know, uh, Robert mentioned about, you know, I, I, Robert Gray, he called in, and he contacted Brandon, and he started repeating some of the things. You know, it's like, don't make a mental mistake, okay? Or, Love Robert Gray. Or baseball is 50% mental and 50% physical, okay? Um, and so it was just little things like that that they picked up on and remembered, and those things will carry over. Same thing with this organization. Mm -hmm. You know, those young men who are going through the program, they will definitely give back to the community. What are some of the challenges, Pastor White, that our youth are experiencing today? Challenges that are different than perhaps when I was coming up through the ranks. I mean, is, is the technology one of the biggest distractors? Well, it's maybe not technology, but it's the use of technology, okay, and what the kids are finding themselves uh, connected with. Okay, and I, I try to tell them that, you know, you can't bring drama into your life all the time, and that's what's happening. You're constantly dealing with someone else's drama. Social media? Yeah, the okay. social media, yeah. yeah. And, and the drama that's coming in is causing you to, you know, to make, you know, some bad decisions, and it's causing more stress to be on them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the less stress, the less drama, or the less drama, the less stress, I think you have a happier child. Mm -hmm. We're trying to leverage social media here at I Love Seville for positivity, mm -hmm. where we're like using this platform to get, um, you know, good vibes and good energy mm -hmm. and good missions and good organizations and businesses out there in a spotlight. And my question for you, Sherrod, is that's one side of it. Right. The other side of it is almost like a keeping up the Joneses effect, where like with every Snapchat filter or every Instagram filter, people look prettier than they actually are. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. And that creates like, I, from my experience, it's like breeding a sense of jealousy with everybody right. when it's not uh, an actual reality or it's not truly authentic. Exactly. Well, mm -hmm. there's two things. Um, our families, one of the things we don't see is garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. And so if you take in a lot of um, external garbage, then you're going to have it internally. And so that was one of the things when our kids were coming up where we didn't have them on a lot of social media during the school week. On the weekend, they could have at it, but during the week, we really didn't do a lot of um, you know computers and phones and all that kind of thing. Um, I feel that there is a pressure now to look attractive all the time. Right. And so That's that like was Instagram. exactly. And so that was one of the things we talked about cuz you know when you know when you're a kid, when we were kids, you know your hair would be jacked up in pictures, you would look not so great <laughs> or your you know clothes would be ripped. And now kids have to feel like they're perfect and presenting themselves perfect all the time. And that I think is uh, puts a lot of stress and they said that more children um, in like younger years are having more depression right. and more issues because of the external stress I think they're putting on because they see this person looking perfect even though they're not really in real life but they're feeling that they have to look that same way as well. Another level of expectation that perhaps is you know unfair and not necessary to be on a plate of a 12, 13, 14, or 15 year old. I mean, enough, I mean, with the stuff that's going through the body alone, exactly. that mm -hmm. is like difficult enough to manage. You're getting some props, Bright Hope Baptist Church. 
is right. chiming in. Bright Hope Baptist Church says, I can't say enough about organizations such as the 100 Black Men of Central Virginia, as our church has had two young black men a part of this program and both received college scholarships. Perry and David Aaron, another wonderful organization wow. for young black nice. men in Louisa County High Schools, um, own our Brothers Keeper, which has mentored one of those same young black men that is currently in college at ODU, also David Aaron, a positive resource for mentoring our young men across the board. Both organizations certainly are. That's Bright Hope Baptist Church. Okay. Um, nice. Throw this to you here. Current events, kind of current topics. How about the challenges of a youth growing up in uh, Charlottesville? I mean, the city of Charlottesville has, is, in the last 18 months, has experienced a roller coaster of, uh, of um, how, how do I put this, emotion? Mm -hmm. A roller yeah. coaster of uh, feelings? Um, throw it to you, sir. What are your thoughts? Well, <clears throat> I believe a lot of youth are actually uh, seeking, you know, not just, not just a way to deal with things through their uh, understanding, but they want to know spiritually what's going on. So uh, that's how I can stand as a pastor also. I know that, you know, I can give some hope that there's more than what you see, you know, that we have someone also, you know, that can help you during this time of need. Uh -huh. So the youth are also seeking the spirituality during this time, you know, to know how can I make it through all of this stuff that's going on because it's too much for me to understand. So I can say, you know what, you don't have to understand it, but there's someone on the inside of you that can help you to deal with what's going on. Love that answer. Dr. Harrison, join us in this conversation. Your thoughts, sir. <laughs> so he's a, he's a role model for all of us. I recall this um, young man who was in one of our summer Academy programs, and the last day uh, we were um, preparing to go to our closing ceremony, they were loading on a bus to go to the <laughs> Holiday Inn, and uh, he just showed his behind, mm -hmm. and um, and and I said never again. The principal came out, never again. Mm -hmm. You'll never be in another program like this the way you behave. Mm -hmm. Next year, Pastor White said we gotta we gotta bring him back. Mm -hmm. We gotta bring him back and. And I'll just take him in my class. He was teaching a seventh grade class at the time, and this young man was a sixth grader. He said, I'll take him in my class. He never gave up on that young man. That young man right now is a junior in high school. He's excelling academically. He's excelling uh, at athletically. He's a superstar at his high school, and I mean a real superstar, because he never gave up on him. And there are just so many other uh, examples of that. Are, are you sharing more connected with current events than ever because of the iPhone and because of social media and because of technology? I mean, growing up, I've, you know, and maybe I just grew up in a bubble or maybe it was my parents that protected me from the, the stuff that was out there. Um, and maybe that's a good call or maybe it's a bad call because having a sense of insulation is not always real life. Um, are youth more aware of what's going on now and more than ever? I do think so because the, you're able to access so much information and it just depends upon where you're receiving this information um, because you know there is a lot of false information out there today and I think that's why so many people are stressed you know because we're seeing so many things and things that are negative um, mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis and that can really induce stress and especially when younger people who don't have their brains quite formulated mm -hmm. it can be really challenging how to synthesize and how to um, you know just understand what it is that you're seeing and so mm -hmm. one of the things I know that I for with my children is we talk a lot about a lot of the things that they're seeing that their content of what they're looking mm -hmm. at um, and I think that's really important like if you have questions about it or if you need to talk about it or if there are things that are making you nervous or scary I mean that is uh, something that's really important to have support systems in place mm -hmm. and a lot of children don't um, one thing about the 100 is I always felt that Kai when he had issues or things he could call Pastor mm -hmm. White and talk to him about some of the things that were making him nervous um, mm -hmm. the things that happened after Seville um, in um, August um, I mean just a lot of things where people are feeling a little bit unsettled and so I think that it's, it's support systems. That's what you have to have in place in order to kind of understand this information that's being disseminated at mm -hmm. such a rapid, rapid rate. I got a follow up to that. That answer was so poignant and so on point. I got a follow up to that, and it's and it's tied to what happened this past week in Charlottesville City Schools. My, again, my son's oh, one. Yes. We were talking about this with. Uh, I was talking about this with my wife. What we would do or what we wouldn't do, mm -hmm. and and just a, a a snapshot for our viewers. We know Charlottesville City Schools were closed for a few mm -hmm. days. Is it a few days? Two, 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 two days. days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two days because of an online threat of, a, of, a, of a armed gunmen coming into the school to do harm. Right. And the question that we had over the dinner table, and we have a long way before we have to deal with this, but still, was, it's prevalent and it's on topic. And the question was, is how would we handle that with our son 
if he was in that situation. Because the school is supposed to be a safe environment. Exactly. An environment for like open-mindedness and learning and exactly. becoming, a rite of passage, right. if you may. How does a parent, does a, does a parent, and I know it's unique to your family, right. um, is a parent up front and say, this is what's happening? Or does a parent try to sidestep and side skirt that? And I want your perspective as well on that, sir. Well, you can't. Okay. You cannot sidestep it or side skirt it because then your children won't be aware. And so, I mean, it, you know, you have to do what's age appropriate, okay. of course, because you don't want to scare them so much. Mm. But they do have to be vigilant in this day and age as far as looking. One of the things I, with my children, I'm like, you cannot wear headphones when you're out in the world. You cannot be looking down at your phone mm. when you're out in the world. You have to be alert and aware of things going on. Advice. I mean, mm. because people, you would think that it'd be safe to go to school, go to the grocery store, go to the movies, and be okay. And in this rough time right now, I mean, you really just have to be aware of your surroundings and what's going on. And that's one of the things that I think we talk about the mm. most. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, as a parent, it is scary, you know, when your children are in the world mm. and you're not seeing them day to day, and you want them to be safe and to stay mm. safe. And that's probably one of the best ways, I think, is just really being mindful of your surroundings and where you are. What are your thoughts, Pastor White? Well, since you said Pastor White, I can change, make sure I'm changed from just being a hundred black man to a pastor. How about, there what, are your, spiritual... how about what are your thoughts, Ricky? What are your thoughts, <laughs> you said Ricky? Pastor White first. Ricky, as, as a man. What are your thoughts as a man? Man, I was ready to right. praise. Well, well, as, as a man, yes, I, sir. As a man, I still have to look at things uh, spiritually okay. because I know that there is more going on than what we see. Okay. So therefore, I have to utilize those tools within me to deal with those things that are more complex than what we can understand. So that's why I have utilized tools such as prayer, and I utilize tools such as reading God's word to find out what's happened spiritually. It's happened before. How did they deal with it? So how are we going to deal with it today? So as a man. I pray as a man of God, I pray at the same time I stay concerned and I stay vigilant. Yes. I love it. Dr. Harrison, your thoughts? So as a part of the organizational structure of the 100 Black Men of Central Virginia, uh -huh. we realize that parents need to talk to their children. Mm -hmm. uh, their children need to feel comfortable talking to them. So if we accept you as a parent in our organization, you have to sign off an agreement that every day as a part of our MCUBE Academy, you will have a conversation with your child about what they experienced that given day. And, and you can't accept, well, how did things go today? Okay. What did you do today? Um, nothing. Okay. We, we work on training them to have those conversations so when situations such as CVO or any other situation comes up, they feel comfortable sharing with their parents because they're accustomed to having conversations with them each and every day. The other part of the program is that we build in opportunities for them to collaborate as individuals, to stretch each other, to think and not, and to, to challenge each other to, uh, to uh, have an ideal, to defend that ideal, um, and to argue, debate, et cetera, those ideals, to prep them for looking at different points of view. It's, so when they're talking to their parents, they're comfortable expressing themselves. Was that kind of, you said you grew up in Martinsville. Absolutely. Okay, was this kind of like um, vulnerability or this kind of concern, and I'm talking about what happened in Charlottesville High School the, you know, this past week, was this kind of like activity or mindset prevalent when you so, were there? So, 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 Jerry, I attended... Um, all black elementary school, uh -huh. grades one through seven. Yes, sir. Same class, first grade, seventh, second grade, third grade, all the way through, same group of students. Okay. Um, eighth grade, I attended Abbott Harris High School, eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade year, I was pulled out to integrate the schools. Okay. I was one of, I don't know how many, okay? I can't even remember that year, whatever happened. It's a total blank for me. I can't tell you how I got back and forth to school. But what I can tell you is that I do not recall any conflicts. My um, uh, 11th grade year, they opened up Martinsville Senior High School, and I, and I attended Martinsville Senior High School where they integrated um, the all-white Martinsville High School and the all-black Abbott Harris. There were no big issues uh, among races. However, I can tell you this, I experienced what I saw was um, uh, direct racism, uh -huh. which caused me, to, caused me to quit something the first time in my life because I had what I considered a racist coach. What was that? Sports? Baseball. Baseball. That's right. Yes, I quit the baseball team. That was the first thing that I ever quit in my life because I could see that there was favoritism uh, for uh, the white players. Uh -huh. You know, I remember the shortstop 
a white shortstop started. His dad owned a department store. His, and he played ahead of my friend, and his friend started before me, and you know, it was like that. The, right. uh, the starting catcher, uh, he's, he was the son of the principal of the school. So one day, I just, after a game, I just walked up to the coach and I said, do you want my uniform now or later? But in terms of like uh, violence or anything like that, none of that, but the racism was there. How was, um, Ricky, how was, uh, how, was, how was August 12th positioned or discussed within the 100? Within 100? Yes, sir. Well, we actually talked about how we would respond. Uh -huh. You know, and there was great debate uh -huh. because we had to make sure that our organization will uh, stand on our tenets okay, of education, mentoring, uh, economic development, yes, sir. health and wellness. We need to make sure that whatever position we took, Okay, that we were making sure that our kids and parents, everyone, okay, were uh, in agreement. So um, Dr. Harrison and uh, Dr. Bellamy at that time and other executives came together. And Dr. Harrison, how did we respond? <laughs> You're pushing back on me. Treasurer to the president. <laughs> That's right. I'm treasurer. That question goes over to the president. That's right. So, I mean, you know, oftentimes when you have organizations, when you have people with different perspectives, you have to understand why they have different perspectives. So, um, and so we had, um, the, the, the 100 black men is, the majority of the members um, of that organization are close, uh, close to my age, slightly younger. And when you bring in younger members, you have some difference of perspectives yes, in, in terms of you know how you go about doing business. So, so for example, with my um, um, dealing with issues like Charlottesville, I have to um, I have to understand um, my growth. Okay, my birth certificate says Negro. I was born a Negro. Okay, mm -hmm. I grew up as a Negro. When I was in college, my 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 ethnicity changed from being black, okay? So did my perspective in life, being black. A few years later, when I was working, I'm an African American, mm -hmm. okay? There's a big difference. So when you have young people today, they only see that perspective of what it is to be an African American. So with someone like Pastor White or myself, you understand the transformation from being a Negro to black to being African American. And so we put those things in perspective when we saw problems such as how the 100 black men of Central Virginia might have dealt with uh, the reaction to August 11th and 12th. It was more of a conservative approach, okay? That was a phenomenal mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. Sizzle <laughs> real that, Harris Tolbert. That was, that was phenomenal. President. That was, what, that, was, that was right. You're taking me too deep here, Jerry. No, I mean, <laughs> you're pulling this stuff out. Yeah, that was so some deep good. question. That was exactly, like, I know. Go well, to the president. I Sharon now. Get out what are your that? thoughts on here? Get, get ready to get out of your comfort oh zone, gosh. Sharon. Oh. What are your thoughts on that? You can go anywhere you want. Anywhere you want. Thoughts on the 12th and sure. something that happened? Um, it was, for me, it was a really nerve-wracking time because I, as a parent, told my son I did not want him anywhere near the downtown mall. I mean, I went that approach where I was like, you are not going to be anywhere near the mall. I don't want you to go out downtown. I mean, I really was fearful for him. Um, my daughter, who was desperate, she's an advocate, was desperate to go downtown. Um, and be, Yeah, I mean, desperate to go downtown. I took her with me out of town. Um, and so all of her friends, um, several of her friends were injured. Um, of August 12th, and I know she would have been with them. And I mean, I'm severely injured with head injuries and broken bones and broken limbs. Um, and it's so funny because um, in one video that I saw from August 12th, I can list so many friends and people we know and my daughter's friends all in one video. Wow. Um, and it's just, I mean, it was really a tragic thing. We were out of town to watch and see your town kind of imploding. Um, and that's how it felt to me. Um, as a parent, like I said, I, I did a lot after, when I came back home that evening, I went you know, to hospitals with friends because some of the kids, um, their parents lived out of state, and so I tried to be an advocate for them until their parents could get here and set up GoFundMes and things like that. But I mean, I just that was just such a, a devastating time. I mean, I basically went the do not go down there 
route. My wife begged me not to go. Of course, me being stubborn, I went. <laughs> right. Um, I was right here outside of this building. I went for two reasons. One, I own the lion's share of this building. And number two, my son, I knew when he get to a got to AP US history or any kind of history class, I wanted to be able to share some perspective to him right. of what I saw firsthand. And that was important to me. Those were the two main reasons. I saw evil and sin I had never experienced in my entire life. Mm -hmm. right. Evil and sin that for 90 days had a dramatic impact on me that lingered and would not leave from a dream standpoint right. or just from an everyday thinking standpoint. And then 90 to about 100 days afterwards, I said, you know what, I'm gonna use this for a positive. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was the inspiration of this show. Mm -hmm. August 12th was the inspiration of this show of how we are going to help do our small part, a very small part in a very macro scheme of things of how we're going to use this show to, to, to breed positivity and, and to, you know, create a dialogue, mm -hmm. have the dialogue, perhaps mm -hmm. the dialogue's the first step, and have discussion. Um, and Dr. Harrison, that is the impetus and the inspiration of what we're trying to do here, where we're trying to leverage social um, and in a community like Charlottesville that I think is divided but slowly coming back together um, and, and, you know, trying to help create that cohesiveness again. So I want to say that in further um, explanation of what we did as a 100 organization. Yes, sir. We didn't feel like we needed to react because we'd already been proactive proactive from the standpoint of giving them materials to read to understand who they are yes, sir. and to be able to make decisions. They read about um, uh, Jackie Robinson and the role he played as a civil rights activist. They read about Arthur Ashe and his, the role that he played as a civil rights activist. They read about Muhammad Ali and had deep discussions about you know, his religious beliefs and how he stood for who he was. Um, and then even after uh, August 12th, we had what we call a Saturday, Saturday Academy, mm -hmm. and we pulled out Frederick Douglass's famous speech, okay? I can't remember what year it was, but Fre Frederick Douglass was an, an orator, I mean like gifted, and he wrote this, this fantastic speech that you know, kind of um, went above the heads of, he spoke, this is a, a, an, a, a slave okay. who freed himself from he ran away. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he went north. And uh, he taught himself. Um, he educated himself. And he became a national speaker. And he spoke to a, 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 a group of um, uh, elected officials, all white. And he said some things that they didn't even understand what he said. And he was basically you know, being very, very critical of their way of doing business and the way that they related to, to, to Negroes at that time. And so we use that speech to help them understand who they are, what their history is, mm -hmm. and how they need to be prepared to respond to situations like August 12th, not having you or anyone else to tell them how they should make a decision, but they make them decisions as independent people right. and independent thinkers. You're on fire today. You're on point today. <laughs> you are on point today. Guys, we have filled um, 65 minutes. Um, I feel like it's been six and a half minutes. I really love everything that's happened today. What I'd like to do is give everyone kind of like a final word where you guys can go any direction you want. Uh, we will turn this into a sizzle reel, a highlight reel, um, any topic, any discussion point, any avenue, um, any direction. Um, the only thing that I would ask is if you interact with the cameras um, and, and we can go anywhere. Um, you do this for a living, so I'm going to put the pressure on you and have you go first, Pastor White. Any direction you want to go, sir, the show is yours. Well, hello, I'm Ricky White. <laughs> <laughs> and today I want to encourage you to be the best that you can be. Don't operate in the, in the bad, the worst, the worst. But no matter what you do, choose to operate in the good, the better, and the best. And I believe that you're going to have a great day. That's awesome. Let's awesome. sizzle reel that. Sharon, the show is yours. Um, I just wanted to say as a parent, I really want to thank the 100 for all the support that they've provided for um, me and my family, and I think it's just a wonderful organization, and I want people to support it because, like I said, it's not just supporting the children, but it's supporting our community as well. I love it. Dr. So, Harrison. So Pastor White has taught me and so many other young men in this community to operate, and I hope I get this right, mm -hmm. the greater than. Mm -hmm not the less than. That's right. Okay. Uh -huh. 
That's the uh, math in you right there. Yes. Uh -huh. Right there? That was good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that and pass that along to my son right there. That was good. Um, guys, I close the show the same way every single time. And first, I would like to thank um, Dr. Bernard Hairston for making this interview possible. He is the president of the 100 Black Men of Central Virginia. Uh, I would like to continue spotlighting this organization because in two interviews we've done, I've truly seen through him, through Pastor White, through Sharon, the impact, through Marquand Jones, through Joshua St. Hill, um, who I encourage you to visit ilovesebo.com and see their interviews, the impact this organization is having on Charlottesville, Almore County, and Central Virginia in totality. Um, and I close the program the same way every time, two ways. Um, folks, if you give more than you take, you will make the world a better place and you will probably end up winning in the end anyway. So please give more than you take and I promise you it's gonna make you feel good and it's gonna make our community even fantastic, more fantastic than, than it already is. And, and the last thing is, is the golden rule. And I'm not gonna make this um, about religion, but I am gonna make this about treating others as you would wanna be treated yourself. And I think now in 2019 in Charlottesville and now in 2019 in the Commonwealth and in the globe in totality, we need the golden rule more than ever. Um, so please, ladies and gentlemen, open the door for somebody. Let someone go ahead of you at a red light. Say hello to somebody when you're crossing the street. Just be nice. Treat others as you want to be treated yourself and watch what happens to our community. Um, my name is Jerry Miller. Tomorrow we are going to have um, Bellamy Brown on set. Now I'm going to introduce you to a leader in our community that is making some big time moves in the city of Charlottesville and perhaps some breaking news from Bellamy Brown. Um, it's the I Love Seville show. My name is Jerry Miller for Harris Tolber, our director, Judah Wickhauer, our producer, Lou Lauren Linsky, also our producer upstairs. I truly enjoyed connecting with you in this platform and I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday at 1230. Enjoy your afternoon. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank thank you. So, if we're still on air, I want the community to know that Jerry has agreed to lead a fundraising event for the 100 Black Men. Yes. I'm saying, this, this is our treasure. We hooked him. I know we're not on air. I, I know Actually, we are so, on air right now. Oh, yeah, you really? Oh, yeah. There's like a 10 second delay. Yeah. Okay. I will do that. Okay. I will do that. And so, I, want to, I want to have this platform, whatever we need to do. Okay. We, we, yeah. need, we need to fund this executive director, and we, we're going to solicit his support. Yeah. We need to fund the MQ program this time. Uh, <laughs> Okay. I will leave that. Okay. And I think the first